my name is Tom Farden and I'm the chair and organiser of Grand Rounds and I've been doing so for a number of years uh, and we had to put Grand Rounds on hold back in well, around the 17th of March because of the Covid pandemic and I've been thinking for the last few weeks how, how we can get a, around bringing the community back together so we can have Grand Rounds again because I think it's well, it's, for me, it's personally been a highlight of, of my week for a number of years, but perhaps I would say that. Um, but I think it is a, a good place to bring people together and, uh, and share experiences. Uh, and I was uh, pleased when Colin Fleming contacted me uh, just this week to say that he'd like to tie in. Sorry, our bleeps are going off. It's not. Sorry, it's yours. <laughs> um, to say that he'd like to um, to combined grand rounds with the consultant zoom that we've been doing on Fridays uh, for the last few weeks within the medical director. Um, this is the equivalent of your child coming in isn't it in the back of the screen and, and we it's, it's all, all havoc all hell goes to pay. Anyway so the what Colin wants to do is is to take the first 10-15 minutes well five or ten minutes of each grand round to have a um, an operational update and then the rest of it will be like normal grand rounds uh, where we have a visiting speaker or a local expert talking about uh, a, a, about an interesting topic. So um, Colin did say to me, uh, could I come up with some sort of uh, mission statement about about Grand Rounds? But I think really what we're what we're trying to do here is uh, is bring people together, share clinical expertise and experience, highlight the uh, latest clinical developments, and showcase new research from findings locally and further afield. Uh, and really just try to pull everyone together in a way that makes us one community. The biggest win for me out of this is that I can see a whole load of GPs. I've always wanted to make sure the GPs, the GPs are waving at me, um, I always wanted them to be involved in Grand Rounds, but they can't because of the travel, um, and hopefully they have been able to watch it on the YouTube channel, but now they can be, take part in it. So welcome to all my primary care colleagues, um, and anyone who's not been to Grand Rounds before, and anyone who's a regular. So what we're going to start off with is um, the operational update uh, and what we're going to, we've asked Danny Chandler from Public Health if he will give us an update on uh, the state of play in Tayside and Scotland regarding COVID, uh, but particularly with reference to the test, test trace isolate support process uh, locally and across Scotland. Usual Zoom etiquette applies, please keep muted unless you're directed towards, don't share your screen unless you're a speaker, and if you have a question, please send it to me on the chat and I will uh, facilitate later. Thank you very much, Danny. Hi, can I check you can hear me okay? Okay, I couldn't hear you, Tom, but I saw you saying yes, lip reading. Um, I'm going to be very brief and I'll start with an apology for being a bit on the underprepared side. Um, it's a very intense day in the midst of an intense week. Um, every week's like that um, kind of has been since February. And I know we're not alone in that in public health, but in particular, um, we've had at the beginning of this week, um, new directives about enhanced support, yet more enhanced support for care homes and um, uh, assurance and, and governance uh, activities around those. Um, we're doing day-to-day -day, um, engagement with care homes without breaks, as most people might be um, expecting um, from a public health point of view. And as Tom referenced, we've also been working um, very intensively to work up plans for TTIS, um, aka contact tracing, and now um, test and protect, I think is the latest terminology. Um, and I say that because I was um, just catch up on the First Minister's uh, statement to Parliament, which um, I think is still ongoing today, um, and we've been working up to that, um, and this is the vision, um, the latest um, perspective from government on what the um, easing of lockdown and the move to a new phase of response will look like. Um, so um, you'll have to bear with me because I've not had a chance to fully absorb everything, but in terms of what we're doing uh, um, at a board level that um, plays into that, um, we have um, a team which we've brought together from um, a number of different services and, and organisations, including environmental health and sexual health and also public health staff to form a contact tracing team who will be um, following up um, positive cases, um, as many as we can um, manage. Um, the majority, if not all of them, uh, is, is our aim as our starting point. Um, and to identify people who have been exposed to them and or 
who have symptoms to channel those individuals into testing as appropriate and uh, medical assessment and then to provide appropriate advice and exclusion. Um, so very similar to the activity and the response um, phase that we were engaging in at the containment. Um, uh, in, the, in that period, in the initial response, we're moving back to that, but with additional um, teams and services and uh, a digital platform, which will support that activity. That platform is going to be fully functional, we're assured by Thursday, hence Thursday next week is our go live date. Um, just in terms of the context, so I think most people will be aware we're well down the, the curve in terms of having reached a peak in activity, which was fairly universal across Scotland as having come at around the end of the first week of April. Um, hospital admissions, um, positive cases, etc. Um, we've got, I think, an average of around 10 to 15 positive cases being reported per day. A large majority of those at this point are care home staff and residents in Tayside, and that's similar in most boards. Um, the peak we were seeing was well over 30 positive cases being reported today uh, per day in Tayside. Um, and so the, the new um, emphasis or the increasing emphasis is on maintaining that position and further reducing the level of activity in a managed way um, alongside the gradual easing of lockdown. So I'm sure you can um, read the latest in terms of um, BBC or other um, media outlet platforms of your choice, um, but that's where I've been looking. So Nicola Sturgeon was saying today that we'll have a sort of period of three weeks and then a review and then another period of three, three weeks and so on. And at each review period, new lockdown measures will be either eased or step up, stepped up again based on um, the epidemiological picture at that point. And the crucial um, number is obviously the R. Um, we've been told again that it's um, estimated to be under one. I don't have a pre precise figure. The last um, best estimate I had was, I've seen was around 0.8 in Scotland. That's a couple of weeks out of date. So hopefully it's even better now, but with quite a wide margin of error between 0.7 and one, and that's probably a familiar range. Um, so the, the purpose of um, contact tracing, test, treat, isolate, or test and protect, and so on, is to try and maintain that through um, doing very avid case detection and management from a public health point of view. Um, so in the next few days, we should be taking a paper to the board locally, which will give the detail of what that plan looks like in, in Tayside in alignment with the national arrangements. That will see us through for the next um, six weeks to, to 12 weeks, um, while we wait for a, a national model for contact tracing to come fully on stream. And this is the sort of 2000 people being recruited um, figure that you may hear being talked about. Um, so there'll be a sort of distributed call center model in effect. Most people with um, symptoms will be tested. In fact, everybody now is being tested if, if um, they present through the um, either the UK government online route or to local services, um, they'll get tested and if positive they'll get channeled into contact tracing through that national system that's tier one and then any more complex or um, um, challenging individuals for contact tracing at that level will be um, referred upwards to board specialist teams i.e health protection and we're working away at um, strengthening or and augmenting our team in order to take on that workload there are lots of uncertainties obviously in terms of the numbers we'll be dealing with and how that will change over time um, what the platform will do and what it won't do. Um, that's the digital tool that will be supporting us. What the policies are, who gets contact traced and who gets prioritised, that's all work in progress. Um, things are moving at a fast pace, but um, we are uh, expecting to be able to start um, on the 28th and to, to start building from there, um, but with a, uh, an approach which will be to try and um, capture as many people with a positive result for contact tracing from, from the outset in, in Tayside. Um, that's um, that's a bit of a stream of consciousness in terms of what's going on right now, um, because I, as I say, I hadn't had a chance to prepare and I need to head off to a, a senior level meeting immediately after this in, in a few minutes, um, but I hope that's been useful um, as a site or as to what's going on from a public health perspective. Um, there'll be other perspectives, Colin or, or yourself, Tom, you might be able to talk about sort of the acute side of things much better than I will, but that's, um, that's about the size of it from, from in terms of what I was planning to say. Thanks, Danny. That's really helpful. And um, I think keeping people up to speed with these kind of developments, which do change on a daily, weekly basis, really helpful. And um, 
and it's important to first remind ourselves that we are we're ahead of the curve here. We've we've had um, you know, compliments from the first minister and, and and in in national media this week about how far how we've been leading in Tayside, and I think we continue to do that thanks to your team of public health really pushing things forward. So thanks so thanks uh, thanks very much. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, to the main event as it were, um, and the the main focus of Grand Rounds, which is part of which is getting um, getting inviting speakers along and it's always great to to welcome people uh, from from out with and and today we're very lucky to have a visiting speaker from Cambridge University uh, and that's Ewan Sunjan Smith um, he has had a storied career traveling around the globe becoming a, an expert in nociception and he now heads up a lab in, in at Cambridge University in the Department of Pharmacology uh, working at uh, with mole rats, which is the background on his screen, you can see there uh, uh, his what he describes as his babies. Um, and uh, but he's going to talk today uh, about the what drives chronic pain uh, with an understanding of uh, of the electrophysiology and the pharmacology of, of nociception. Uh, and I'm grateful for Tim Hales. I'm not I can't see him on the screen, but Tim Hales uh, did introduce me to to you, and um, so it's so thanks to him for for making those links. Um, I would normally say thanks for making the journey up, Ewan, but thanks for logging in, and I'm really looking forward to hearing hearing your talk. Please unmute and um, and share your screen. Great. Okay. Thanks for that introduction. Um, I can't actually share my screen. I think you've got to enable me to. Do I have to do that? I'm yeah. Uh, share the screen. Uh, one part. Uh, Tricky. This is like the normal IT problems one has on. Well, one yeah, that, yeah, absolutely. Um, try yeah, now. Thoughts. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There you go. How, totally professional. <laughs> so hopefully everyone should be able to see that now. Perfect. Thanks very much. Perfect. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks for that introduction, Tom. Um, I'm very much a basic scientist uh, looking at how sensory nerves work in different painful conditions to try and identify new targets for uh, controlling pain in a variety of different conditions. And the focus really in the lab is the primary sensory neuron, uh, which for the most of the body, uh, their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. And that's what you can see in this image here. We'll come back to this later on. This is a, a dorsal root ganglion that's been stained for some particular proteins of interest. Um, and in this talk today, I want to run through a few things. Uh, just a very brief overview of the sensory nervous system. I'm very much aware that people have different backgrounds, so apologies if some of this is either too basic or too complicated, but hopefully most of it will get it about right. Um, and as I said, although I'm a basic scientist, um, we try to interact as much as we can with a pain clinic here in Cambridge and, and elsewhere. And I want to do about three different stories, uh, one about knee joint pain, uh, one about uh, the colonic sensory system, and uh, one that I'll just say is a, a tale of painless delivery. And all of these have uh, human uh, points of interest for us. Um, when I'm going through this, don't panic when the knee joint pain seems to be going on a bit, because I'll tell you now, it's by far and away the longest part. So the, the points three and four will be shorter stories. So I'll aim to talk for 45 to 50 minutes or so, and there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, so in terms of the sensory nervous system, um, if we go back in time, uh, Jan Brugge, the elder, and Rubens had these five paintings of the five senses. So we've got um, sight, taste, hearing, touch, and smell. Uh, but if we look more closely, we can see that there are, in fact, other senses that we need uh, to act normally. So if we zoom in on this uh, picture of smell here, uh, we can assume that the lady must have a fairly good um, sense of thermoception because she has taken it to wear no clothes outside. So we can assume it's warm on that day. At least that's the idea I'm going to go with rather than it saying something about what the people painting the picture were thinking at the time. So we've got the ability to sense warm and cold. If we uh, zoom in on the hearing image, we can see that this lady is very cleverly looking at us while playing a musical instrument. So she must know where her hands are, her fingers are, uh, without actually looking at where everything is. So this is then the sense of proprioception, knowing where different bits of your body are. Now all of these are interesting, but by far and away the most interesting thing for me is what we observe when we zoom in on the touch image. Because here we have a picture of the same lady cuddling, presumably her child of some description. Um, but next to her, we've got these rather brutal looking instruments. And these were the medical instruments of choice back in the 1600s. And I think it doesn't take much imagination to assume that when these things are sort of being pushed into your body, that they would be evoking the sense of pain, nociception, 
Um, so just to remind those who might not remember, nociception is the neural process of encoding a noxious stimulus, the ouch part, and pain most certainly has a sensory and emotional component. And I'll do what every uh, basic scientist does, which is wrong, which is to use the terms interchangeably. Most of what I'm going to be talking about will be nociception. Um, that's largely because a lot of the work I'll be talking about is work on mice. And, and no matter what I think the mouse might be feeling, um, I don't really know. So we usually use the term pain, but obviously we're studying nociception. So in terms of the sensory nervous system that enables us to feel uh, and interact with our outside world, this is what the standard textbook will show you. So here we have some skin and we've got some hairs coming out of it. And there are two main senses, sensory nerve fiber. Those shown in blue here are the mechanoreceptors. And these tend to innovate specific end organs, so Puccini corpuscles and so forth. And these enable us to detect things such as light brush of the skin, vibration, and so on and so forth. And although these are very important, I would argue the more exciting sensory nerves are those shown in red, the nociceptors. And these don't tend to innovate specific parts, but rather just innovates quite densely, especially the skin, because that, of course, is the organ of ours which is most likely to come into contact first with something that could damage us. And upon excitation of the end of this nerve, an electrical signal will fly along all the way to the central nervous system, first stop being the spine. And what's shown here is what most textbooks will show you is that nerve one talks to nerve two and a signal goes up towards the brain. And that's true for about 5% of these primary sensory neurons. The vast majority synapse onto interneurons, things get confusing, and then it goes up to the brain where the circuitry is even more confusing. So in my lab, we accept the fact that we're perhaps not that clever and we ignore the spinal cord, we ignore the brain and try to work, on, work out what's going on at these primary sensory neurons. Because if you can block pain at its source, how these initial neurons are activated, then perhaps we don't need to worry about the more complex parts of the circuitry. Now clearly this isn't going to be the case for someone who has been experiencing chronic pain for say 10 years, where there will have been substantial changes to the circuitry in the spine and or the brain. But what we're taking here is the approach if we block pain at its source early on, hopefully we can prevent any of those long-term changes occurring. And you might think of this as being at the dentist when you're gonna have something ripped out. The first thing we'll do hopefully is administer a local anesthetic. And all that it does is it blocks the voltage-gated sodium channels in these sensory nerves, and therefore it doesn't matter what stimulus activates the nerve ending, you cannot conduct the signal, you won't have any sensation. Now the cell bodies for these sensory neurons, um, for the body, are located in the dorsal ganglia, the DRG. And these have to make the proteins that are then trafficked to the end of the nerves, that enable those nerves to function, to detect different stimuli, be that heat, capsaicin, the substance that makes chili peppers taste hot or acid, mechanical stimuli, whatever they might be. And so these nerve cell bodies act as a good model for what's going on at the sensory nerve ending. It's very difficult in humans, in mice, to actually investigate what's going on at the molecular basis at the nerve ending because the sensory nerve is embedded in complex tissue. So what we often do and what you're seeing a lot of the data today is we take out these cell bodies and we use as a model of what's going on at the sensory nerve ending. So if we look at lots of different studies, people have shown that the sensory neurons are quite often polymodal. That is a nociceptor will be activated by say heat and mechanical force and certain chemicals, acid for example. There will be some nerves that only detect one stimulus. Maybe it's just a, a nerve that detects noxious heat. The problem is that if you were to take um, an organism, a model organism of choice, say a mouse, you took out all the dorsal ganglia and you cultured all those individual neurons, you don't know where those neurons went. And we would expect that nerves innervating different parts of the body might have a different function. For example, we might assume that sensory nerves innervating the skin are more tuned to mechanical detection than, say, nerves that innervate the heart or the bone. And so it's important to consider what the um, sighted innervation is of those sensory neurons. And that's something that my lab focuses on an awful lot. So in the first story, I want to tell you about drivers of knee joint pain. A lot of this work was done by Sam Chakrabarty, who just finished her PhD and managed to get to Berlin about two weeks for her postdoc before the lockdown started. So she arrived in a new city, didn't speak the language, and immediately got shut in a flat for a while. But they're back at work, um, so hopefully she'll be carrying on uh, with exciting stuff soon. Um, so what she was interested in was arthritic pain. And of course, if we think about humans, arthritic pain will be coming from a joint. Our focus is going to be here on the knee joint. So if we have our knee joint that's injured, signals will go along these primary sensory nerves whose cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglia and send their signals to the brain. 
Our model organism of choice is the mouse. This is primarily for reasons I'll show you that it's quite experimentally uh, malleable. And also, um, we know a lot about the genetics. So if we find certain genes of interest, there's the potential for making animals that lack that gene of interest to see how that affects pain. And if we want to study the sensory nerves innervating the knee, we can do that with chemicals called retrograde tracers. And what we can do is we can inject the tracer through the patella tendon into the knee joint. This then gets taken up by the sensory nerves and goes to the dorsal ganglia, where the cell bodies are. So if we now take a section through a dorsal ganglia, say a week after we've done this procedure, you can see here on the left, we have an image of the dorsal ganglia just looking down the normal microscope. If we then excite that with a certain wavelength of light, we then get certain cells that are glowing blue. These are the nerves that have taken up the dye from the knee, i.e. those are the nerves that are innervating the knee. So if we want to study arthritis pain, and we're gonna use a model of arthritis in our mouse, it's the function of these nerves that's of interest to us. And so this is the technique we use, retrograde tracing. So we have our mouse, we've injected our retrograde tracer, and there are a lot of different models that one can use for arthritis, depending on if you want something that's more osteoarthritis-like or if you want something that's more rheumatoid-like. And none of these models are perfect. They all have their pros and cons. One of the ones that we tend to use quite a bit is a complete Foyne's adjuvant model, which is a, a, a largely a model of rheumatoid arthritis. So we wait one week after our tracer injection because it takes time for the tracer to get back to the ganglia. And then we inject complete Foyne's adjuvant into the knee capsule. This will then evoke a state of inflammation. And we can see this here, we have our mouse, this is the non-injected knee, this is the injected knee. If you measure these with calipers, we can see that after CFA, we had an increase in the knee width. So we've got an inflammatory uh, joint situation going on here. The other side of the knee does not change, the contralateral side. So this is very much a localized insult. The advantage of doing this with the mouse is that you've got your, every mouse acts as its own control. One side of the mouse has experienced the insults, the other hasn't. You can collect the dorsal ganglia from the side that innervate where you've got your injury, the site that, that the nerves that innervate the healthy site, and compare and contrast to see what has changed in those nerves. But of course, we only want to look at that if we can observe that the change in knee width observed here actually correlates with any change in pain behavior. And there's been a lot of work looking at how to study pain in mice. And a lot of models that people do involve stimulating the animal in some way and measuring a behavioral response. The idea being that when the animal is experiencing, for example, here, knee inflammation, it will um, have it will experience hyperalgesia and therefore it will show a decrease in the withdrawal threshold to a noxious stimulus. But this is sort of like going along to your rheumatologist saying you're in pain and then they whack your knee with a hammer every week and see how much your response changes. So it's not very, very indicative of what the sort of pain is that a human will be experiencing. Most people with joint pain will take, complain about ongoing pain, stiffness, pain that affects their ability to move. What we've tried to do with mice is try to look at um, assays that might better reflect ongoing pain in the animal. And one that we've done is to look at digging behavior. So what happens here is we've got the time course, the experiment over on the left. We've got our control animals. We then inject this tracer into the knee joints. Um, we wait a week, we inject our inflammatory stimulus. And all these time points with the triangles, we're measuring digging behavior. What that means is it means putting a mouse in a clean cage. We measure for three minutes how long it digs. And we can see here that this animal has been digging for 40 odd seconds out of the three minutes. And this one at the very end of the experiment has only been digging for three seconds. So the idea being the same as if you were in pain, you are not likely to want to be acting very much. I go running quite a lot, but if I've hurt my knee, I'm going to run less. And we think this is what's going on in the mice. At least that's what we're assuming at this point. We know that the CFA mice have an inflamed knee. The mice which only have the fluorescent tracer do not. And if we look at this quantitatively, we can see that the digging duration of these animals with inflammation is significantly less than either at the very beginning of the experiment, after they've had the tracer, or the day before the complete Freund's adjuvant injection. Similarly, if we measure how many burrows they make, it decreases. So at this point, all we can say is, okay, you've got some mice with an inflamed knee and they dig less. And I'm claiming that this might have something to do with their sensation of pain. So if that's the case, we should then be able to study the sensory nerves innervating the knee and observe a difference between the knee neurons going to the site of inflammation in the CFA mice versus the control side of the mouse. So the way we do this is we isolate individual sensory neurons and we put an electrode into them, that's what this shadow is here, and this blue again is one of our labeled cells, and we can measure the activity of this nerve. 
We can measure the amount of electrical current we have to inject, to generate an action potential, an electrical signal in that nerve. And we can also measure its response to different stimuli. So capsaicin, the substance that makes chili peppers taste hot, we know that activates a specific ion channel called TRIP-V1 that's also activated by heat. And I'm just going to show you briefly some of this work, which is that if we measure the amount of current we have to inject into the cell to generate an action potential, these are our normal neurons going to the site of, uh, health, of the healthy knee, shown in black, and in red, these are nerves going to the site of inflammation. And we get a decrease in the action potential threshold. That means that these nerves have become more sensitive. They need a smaller input to generate an electrical signal. Similarly, if we look at the number of neurons that respond to capsaicin, the substance that activates TRIP-V1, we can see that we get an increase in the percentage of cells that are innovating the inflamed side that respond to this substance. Now, there is a problem with this whole technique, which is to get the nerves out of the mouse, put them in a dish and put an electrode in them, we always had to kill the mouse. And when you do this process and you dissociate the neurons by enzymes, there's always a possibility of the changes that we observe are due to the culturing technique we've used or because we've impaled the nerves in electrode rather than it being actually a, a representative change in the nerve. So a complementary set of experiments we did was to look at the expression level of the TRIP-V1 protein that we know is responsible for, the, uh, for mediating this response to capsaicin. So what we're looking at here are some dorsal ganglion sections. These blue cells are the ones that we know innervate the knee because they've taken up our retrograde tracer. And then we use antibodies to detect proteins of interest. So here we're looking at the TRIP-V1 protein shown in pink. This track A in green, this is the receptor for nerve growth factor, a substance which has a lot of interest in for osteoarthritis pain with monoclonal antibodies targeting its signaling. And then we can merge everything together. And what we've done is we've counted the percentage of neurons expressing TRIP-V1 and TRAC a And we can see that just like our electrophysiological studies, in the CFA side of the animals, we have an increase in the number of neurons that are expressing TRIP-V1. We see no change in the TRAC a percentage, but interestingly, we see an increase in the co-expression. So there's a whole literature out there showing that nerve growth factor binds to TRAC a to generate an increase in TRIP-V1 expression. We know from the animal literature, from the human literature, that in inflammatory situations of the joint, we've probably got nerve growth factor being released. And so it's possible that why we have an increase in co-expression is we have nerve growth factor acting on track A to drive this increase in TRIP-V1. But if I'm trying to claim here that the animals have knee inflammation, they dig less, and that there's this increase in TRIP-V1 in nerves innervating the knee, and that that has anything to do with pain, then we should be able to block TRIP-V1 function and actually measure a change in behavior. And indeed, that's what we were able to observe. So this is the digging assay again. We've got animals at the starting healthy point. We inject CFA, they dig less. If we give the antagonist to TRIP-V1, within 30 minutes, we get a reversal, a normalization of digging behavior. Similarly, the number of burrows goes back to normal. Now, because this is happening within 30 minutes, we can be fairly confident the reason this occurs is because TRIP-V1 is blocking, sorry, the TRIP-V1 antagonist is blocking TRIP-V1 at the end of those sensory nerves, innervating the knee. There's not time for there to be any longer process about a change in inflammation or impact on the brain because this is a peripherally restricted drug. Moreover, it could, we can rule out any systemic sort of locomotory effects by injecting the antagonist into animals that have not had any inflammation. And here we observe that it has no effect on either the number of burrows or the amount of time dug. So the idea is then that during inflammatory processes, TRIP-V1 is upregulated. And if we block it, we can normalize pain behavior as measured using this assay. Now, there's other literature out there suggesting that TRIP-V1 may be a reasonable target for pain. One of the problems is getting drugs that are selective and specific. For example, some of the early work looking at um, TRIP-V1 antagonists, when you gave them to humans, they cause hyperthermia. And the last thing you really want if you're in pain is to take your drug to relieve pain and end up with flu-like symptoms. It does seem there might be a therapeutic window whereby you can have drugs that give you the pain relief without the hypothermia. And our work would suggest that that would be something you could certainly do, especially if you had localized administration to the knee. But of course, in real life, the, what's stimulating those sensory nerves? And in most arthritic conditions, other than mechanical loading changes when somebody walk, walks, it's likely to be the synovial fluid. And here I'm going to be focusing on osteoarthritis as the disease condition. We know, as I've just been mentioning, it contains inflammatory mediators such as nerve growth factor. 
And we wondered if we could use our mouse system for studying how sensory nerves work combined with a human disease. Can we use synovial fluid from patients who are having it removed at um, a steroid injection clinic? Could we take that synovial fluid and look at its ability to modulate sensory neurons? Does it do anything? If it does, we might be able to identify new mediators of pain. So the flow of the experiments work like this. We have our um, osteoarthritis patients, they have the synovial fluid removed. We take our mice, we label the knee neurons, and we then combine these two. And the studies I'm going to show you here involve a situation where we've incubated these sensory nerves overnight with synovial fluid. So this isn't an acute application, I can talk about that later, but all I'm showing you here is the long-term studies. Because obviously in real life, these people are experiencing their condition for a long time, and the synovial fluid can have an impact on what proteins are being expressed by those nerves innervating the knee to potentially change their sensitivity. And the way we measured this was using electrophysiology to measure the knee neuron excitability, and then a technique called Kaus imaging, which again gives you a method for saying, do the nerves get switched on or not by substance X? So what we did is we measured the electrical excitability of these knee nerves, depending on if they're incubated in normal medium that we use for looking after the cells or synovial fluid from osteoarthritis patients. And these are action potentials from normal cells. These are ones in osteoarthritic synovial fluid. And this is looking at the amount of current that has to be injected. And although this is just an NF1, I'll show you the data in a minute, we had a big decrease in the amount of current you have to inject. These cells have become hyper excitable when we put them in synovial fluid taken from osteoarthritis patients who were in pain. But there's a big problem here because what we're comparing is medium that cells are usually kept in, which is very different from synovial fluid. So what we needed to get hold of was healthy synovial fluid. This is a bit more of a problem because we don't have a lot of it. So we had to um, purchase this rather than getting it through clinics. There are ways of getting it, say, from sports injuries where you haven't got a chronic condition, but again, you don't really know what's happened in that instance. So our control synovial fluid has come from um, post-mortem samples from people with no known joint disease. And again, we're going to look at the electrical excitability comparing cells in normal medium versus those in the different types of synovial fluid. And we're looking here at two different measures of electrical excitability in the nerve. This one here is the resting membrane potential. It tells you from a basal standing point how excitable is the neuron. The cells in the control media are where we want them to be. The control synovial fluid is exactly the same. So synovial fluid generally doesn't do anything. But the osteoarthritis synovial fluid causes a depolarization of the resting membrane potential. Now to generate an action potential, you have to depolarize a cell. The osteoarthritic synovial fluid has already driven a degree of depolarization, which means again, you need a lesser stimulus to generate an action potential and generate a sensation of pain. And indeed, that's what we observe when we inject current to measure what threshold the action potentials have, it decreases specifically in the osteoarthritic synovial fluid group. We don't have any change for synovial fluid from healthy individuals. But this is very much an early sort of proof of concept piece of work where we can take synovial fluid from patients with known conditions and we can use our mouse system to generate um, a way of screening for potentially the ability to induce pain. What we're now trying to do is to obtain funding to really interrogate what is in the synovial fluid from different sorts of patients to try and identify new pain targets. But I think this is definitely a system we should be able to, move, uh, should be able to use moving forwards. What I've tried to tell you so far, though, is that in a mouse model of inflammation, the nerves become hyperexcitable, the mice have pain. Here we're looking at uh, uh, synovial fluid from humans in pain, we get hyperexcitable neurons. So is there a way by which we can change the excitability of neurons, innovating the knee, to control pain? And that's what we're going to look at next. So the knee innervating sensory neurons become hyperexcitable in a mouse model of inflammation. Synovial fluid from individuals with arthritis sensitizes these neurons. They become hyperexcitable. And what we've moved to is a way of trying to measure the ability to control sensory nerve function rather than just giving drugs systemically. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction to the way we're trying to do this, which is to use adeno-associated viruses. These are essentially viruses with a low pathogenicity, pathogenicity, you can read the word. They have a negligible immune response, um, but they have a high tropism for different sorts of cell types. So there are different types of AAV. You can engineer these in order to make a virus that preferentially um, infects, for example, sensory nerves, uh, cortical nerves, muscle, whatever it is of interest. When we started this project, there were major problems for looking at how to infect 
DRG neurons from the knee. Most of this work had been done in the brain or injecting at the site of interest, so into a chunk of muscle, for example. The problem we have for DRG neurons is there's a long distance from the periphery to the place you're trying to infect. There's large structures. If you inject into the enteric nervous system, there's a lot of things going on. And indeed, there basically there are no labeling studies looking at labeling of neurons in the periphery to label the DRG neuron, like with our fast glue. So we entered into a collaboration with Paul Heppensall at Emberlin in Italy, um, who's an expert in production of AAVs. And we worked with a certain variant of AAV9 called AAV PHPS. So this is what it did. Here we're looking at our dorsal ganglia, and we're looking at the lumbar DRG that in the mouse are known to innervate the knee. And this is telling us the percent of neurons that are labeled when we inject the knee with this particular variant of AAV. And the cool thing is, we get an almost identical level of or efficiency of labeling as with fast glue, a tracer that's used by hundreds of labs around the world for a very long time. So this demonstrates that we have a virus which is able to infect sensory nerves specifically at a similar efficiency to a standard retrograde tracer. But the difference between a standard retrograde tracer like fast glue and an AAV is you can get that AAV to encode things of interest. And what we want to do is we want to use the AAV system to develop a special sort of receptor. And I'm just going to use one slide to explain how this works. So if we just imagine a model sensory neuron here, and we've got two sorts of receptors um, to acetylcholine, the standard neurotransmitter. There's an M3 receptor and an M4 receptor. And if you activate the M3, it's excitatory, so it would switch on the nociceptor. The M4 is inhibitory, it switches off the nociceptor. And what people have done is they've taken these two types of receptor and they've mutated them in such a way that they're no longer activated by acetylcholine, but they are activated by this thing called compound 21, C21. Now this compound cannot activate the endogenous receptors. It only activates these what are called designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. So what we can do is we can take an AAV, we can make it encode one of these receptors. We can inject it into the knee and make those knee sensory neurons express a receptor which is doing nothing until we inject compound 21. And at that point, we can excite the nerve or we can switch the nerve off. And the aim of this study was to try and get this inhibitory version of the dread being expressed by knee innovating neurons, apply our compound 21 and switch off pain behavior in mice. That's what our goal was. The idea being that if you could translate this to humans, you could have gene therapy just of sensory nerves innovating the knee and therefore you could have a localized level of pain relief. So I'm going to start off by talking about the GQ. This is the excitatory dread. So we've got our virus, we've got um, a promoter, we've got our receptor, and M cherry is a fluorescent tag. So like with our fast blue, we can see which neurons have been infected. So again, when we look in culture, we can see that this nerve here has been infected. And what we're going to do is we've got male mice, we've got female mice, and we inject them, or we, sorry, we incubate them with compound 21. The idea being, that if it activates this excitatory receptor, we should see a change in the excitability of the neuron. And indeed, that's what we see. We see no change in the resting membrane potential. We have an increase in the number of neurons that are now spontaneously active. They're firing action potentials. But the exciting thing was we see a decrease in the action potential threshold. So just like the mice experiencing inflammation have hyperexcitable neurons, the neurons incubated with synovial fluid have an increased excitability, switching on this random receptor that the mouse has never seen before causes hyperexcitability. So with that in mind, can we get any changes in behavior if we drive this excitatory system? But of course, there's a control experiment you need to do first. So these are the three uh, paradigms we're using. The digging assay I've explained to you before. Dynamic weight bearing works exactly the same way as it does in humans. You can measure here the stride length of the mouse, how much weight the mouse puts on different pores, depending on where the insult is, and so on and so forth. And then the rotor rod is this assay shown here, where the animals are going on a rotating wheel, and it's basically a measure of general locomotion. Uh, interesting with this assay, the, the level of inflammation we generally induce in our model doesn't change any running activity of the animals but it is a way of saying, is our animal being sedated by the drugs we're using? So we run these assays, we then inject our chemogenetic activator to either switch on or switch off the neurons, and we measure the behaviors again. 
But the control experiment has to be first of all, hang on, does this compound 21 really do nothing to normal mice? So we just wanted to check that first. These are mice that have not been injected with anything. We just give them the compound 21. We measure how long they dig for, how many burrows. We measure their weight bearing. We measure their time spent on the rotor rod. Essentially, at the doses we're using, this compound 21 doesn't do anything. So this is good. We can go into this system and now ask, if we have mice expressing the excitatory or inhibitory version of these receptors, can we modulate animal behavior? And of course, the one we really want to see working is, can we switch off pain? But I will just show you firstly, can we activate pain? Um, and essentially, we, we couldn't. So what we've got here are, are two groups of mice. We've got all the mice who are expressing the activated um, or the excitatory form of the receptor. These are our control mice. So they've got the receptor, but we don't give them the drug. We just give them vehicle. Nothing really changes. We tend to see normally that you get a bit of a decrease in digging over time, probably because the animals get a bit bored. Um, if we've got the excitatory, versus other sensory neurons. So what could be happening here is we're affecting proprioceptors, the animals just aren't as, as sensory aware, and we get a change in locomotion. What we want to do in the future is target specific subsets biology studies, but in the behavior paradigm, we can't generate pain. But remember, that's not really too important. What we want to do is switch off inflammatory pain with the other version of the receptor. So we're going to use the same model I explained earlier on, which is that we have our control mice, we have ones with CFA where we get inflammation. Can we in reverse their pain when we activate the inhibitory version of this dread? And the answer is yes. Here we have our control group of animals. So we've got the pre-CFA, they then dig less after inflammation. If we now go to the vehicle, we have no change. We get a significant decrease in behavior across time. By contrast, in our animals on the right here, where we've got pre-CFA, they dig less after CFA. If we give compound 21 to activate the inhibitory receptor to switch the nociceptors off, we get a reversal back to normal levels in both digging duration and the number of burrows. So this for us is a really exciting sign because we've used this assay quite a lot in different pain contexts. And here we can see that using a gene therapy approach, we can decrease the digging behavior. We can get it back to normal. In the rotor rod, nothing happened, so that's fine. It means we don't switch off the nerves, but CFA itself doesn't do anything. The slightly odd one, which was a bit frustrating, was the dynamic weight bearing. Again, in the vehicle, you get a decrease with the CFA. The animals spend less time on the rear paw that's been injected. When we give the compound 21, we don't reverse this. You can see there are certain animals that do change, and they all change a little bit, but it's certainly not very convincing in their animals that do not. So it looks like in this particular model, but when we measure pain in different ways, we are able to reduce pain, but not in a uniform way. We also wanted to see what would happen at the neuronal level, because if we see these behavioral effects, a reversal of the digging behavior, is that actually anything to do with engaging this receptor on the knee innovating neurons? So again, we did our electrophysiology where we, where we take the nerves, we incubate them with compound 21 and measure their excitability. Again, we see no change in the resting membrane potential. The, anim the cells from the inflamed animals do show spontaneous action potential firing. We don't see that when we apply compound 21. Importantly, exactly as I showed you in the first part of this study, CFA decreases the threshold required to generate firing in a nociceptor. And this is normalized when we give compound 21. So this all fits in with what we've observed at the behavioral level. These neurons innovating the knee are accepting this receptor, sorry, are expressing this receptor, which we can activate with this exogenous compound to switch off activity and re reduce pain. So to summarize this first part of the talk, which I said, trust me, is a lot longer than the other two parts, um, the mice with inflammation dig less. The knee neurons become hyper, hyper excitable, and this is because of a decrease in action potential threshold, an increase in the frequency of capsaicin response, which correlates with an increase in expression of trypv1, which mediates that capsaicin response. If we give a trypv1 antagonist systemically, we normalize digging within 30 minutes. 
If we take synovial fluid from patients with osteoarthritis, we again can generate neuron hyperexcitability um, in terms of an increased uh, membrane potential and a decreased actual potential threshold. What we're really trying to do now is look at what factors are present in the synovial fluid that are able to generate these effects. And we're also generating an animal model of this whereby we inject the synovial fluid and we measure the changes in swelling and the changes in behavior of the animal. But that's too preliminary for me to talk about here. And the bit I'm most excited about is this delivery of the GI dread to knee neurons, which could at least offer encouragement for, part, for gene therapy being a way of treating the pain in arthritis. The next step now has to be a way of increasing efficiency and targeting specific neuronal subsets. We want to target the nociceptors, but nothing else. Okay, so the next part of my talk is moving from knees to the, the gut. And this is all the work of a postdoc, Jim Hockley, who uh, recently left the lab to go off to work for GSK. And um, in the gut, we have to remember that there's lots going on. It's complicated, but the two main sensory nerves of interest um, are the lumbar splanchnic nerve, which goes to thoracolumbar DRG, and the pelvic nerve, which goes to lumbar sacral DRG. And we don't really understand a lot about the molecular pathways that are driving visceral sensation. The distal colon is what we're very interested in because it's the key source of pain and discomfort in IBD and IBS. So in this study, we wanted to look more about what's going on at the molecular level in these nerves. Are all the nerves present here the same? Do you just need the lumbar splanchnic versus the pelvic nerve just because you've got a lot of gut and you need two nerves, or are they doing different jobs? One might expect the pelvic nerve to be more controlling of defecation than, say, the lumbar splanchnic nerve. So what Jim did is he labeled the colon in the same way I've shown you we can label the knee. We can take DRG neurons that go to each of these nerves, and through a process I'm not really going to go through here, we can look at the gene expression in all of these nerves and try to identify are the different groups of nerves that express this cluster of genes versus that cluster of genes. Can we identify sets of nerves based on their gene expression that may be uh, responsible for the sensation of pain versus mechanosensory nerves that are probably just involved in sensing paracelsis and controlling defecation and so forth. And the answer to that was, was yes, otherwise I wouldn't be showing it. What we're looking at here is a matrix of gene similarity. So we've got 314 cells down here, 314 across here. And if you're red, it means that this cell here is very similar to this one. But if you're blue, it means you're very different. So we've got a very big group of similar neurons and ever smaller groups. We can look at this in a, a different way. And we've now got color coded our seven groups of neurons. Now of the thoracolumbar neurons, part of the lumbar splanchnic nerve, Nearly all of them were part of five groups. The lumbar, lumbar sacral neurons going to the pelvic nerve, a third of them were in those same five groups. But the cool thing was, based on gene expression at least, there are two groups that are completely different. So these nerves are purely present in the pelvic population. Now, of course, with bioinformatics and, and looking at gene expression, you can basically show anything you want if you manipulate your data cleverly. What we want to be sure is, well, does this actually have any functional relevance? Now, I'm not going to walk you through all the validation of this study. I want to show an example of where, why we think this could be of use clinically. Because what we're trying to do is think about the different sorts of stimuli the gut encounters, look at these different populations of neurons we've got. Can we match these to any specific sensations, pain being the one of interest? And what I'm going to tell you about here for a couple of minutes is a study looking at irritable bowel syndrome, high prevalence disease, pushing 10 million in the UK, you get abdominal pain and disordered bowel movement. It comes in different flavors. Some people have constipation, some diarrhea, some mixed. And we entered this as a collaboration between Nicholas Sanak in Toulouse, David Bulmer, who recently came to Cambridge. And what Nick did is he screened all the lipid mediators present in these different conditions. And one he found of interest was this 5-oxoeat, which is a metabolite of arachidonic acid. It was upregulated purely in people with IBSC, so irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. So if it's present, what does it do? Does it cause any pain in mice? Does it look like it might be of interest? Well, if you take a mouse and you can do similar experiments in humans, you use colorectal distension. And what you do in mice is when you distend using different pressure shown here, you measure the, the visceromotor response. So this is the, basically the muscle contraction response to distension of the colon. And in animals in black here, which have been administered the 5 oxoeat, you get a much bigger response than the control animals at all pressures. So they have a more sensitive gut. The really cool thing is, that in the gut, when you administer this, we see no overt inflammation, which is exactly the same as with IBS. Irritable bowel disease, so inflammatory bowel disease, you've got gross inflammation, the colon looks horrific. Here, it looks pretty normal. 
So this sits in similarly with what we observe in the human body. If we take sensory neurons and we apply fibroxoid, it switches on the nerves. So this is all good. It switches on nerves, it causes an increase in pain in mice, and it's present in humans experiencing pain. The question is, of course, well, can we identify what's going on? If we can identify which the disease mediator, which neuron population it acts upon, could we then potentially block just that one population, preserving all the rest? That would mean you'd have a much smaller set of side effects if you're targeting your pain relief rather than say giving morphine which will hit all the nerves so we want to look at targeted pain relief but to do that we have to say okay can five oxalates specifically activate just one population of these neurons so i'm not going to go through the details of the experiments but we identify that this one receptor merg prd was responsible for the for this sensitivity to five oxalate and what we could do is we could take advantage of collaboration with David Hughes, who has a mouse where this receptor is tagged with green fluorescent proteins. So we can look in the mouse and see where is this receptor present. We can then label the colon from these mice and look at colon innovating nerves expressing this receptor. And this is what we're looking at. We've got our fast blue. This is our green mouse. And we can look at how many nerves innovating the colon express this receptor. It comes out at about 7%, which doesn't sound like very many. But the cool thing is, when we go back to our database to look at all our nerves, it's this one population, the non-peptidergic nerve population down here. It's 14 cells out of all 314 are the only nerves that express this receptor. So the next steps of this study are going to be to see what happens if we ablate the function of these nerves. Can we relieve pain in models of irritable bowel syndrome? Because if we could, but everything else stays intact, so we don't get effects on um, stall frequency and these sorts of things, we'd be leaving all of these other sensory nerves intact if we just target the receptor expressed by this one population. So it's the next phase of the study, but we certainly feel that using this approach, we have a better chance of targeted pain relief to minimize the number of side effects. So RNA sequencing um, identifies neurons and enhances the power of data or output. We believe there are seven sensory subtypes in the mouse, at least. We validated some of this in the human. Two are distinct to the pelvic nerve. And this one group, this MNP group, look like they could be important for mediating pain through this one mediator, 5 oxalate in irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. We still need to do a lot of work to look at these other um, subsets and what they might be relevant to. Okay, so in the last uh, few minutes, I want to move uh, further down the human body and look at another, another painful condition that <clears throat> um, I have never experienced, but half the people listening may well have done. And that's to look at labor pain. Um, so the idea here was to take advantage of a natural phenomenon and try and identify new genetic variants. And this happened by a collaboration with, with Mike Lee and Jeff Woods at the pain clinic in Cambridge where, and other um, maternity units throughout the UK. And what we were doing was looking for patients um, who upon giving birth reported no pain and didn't request analgesics or otherwise healthy. Now I'm not going to go through all the screening, suffice to say there was a population of people who fitted these categories. And what we did is we invited them back and carried out a whole load of quantitative sensory testing to look at their detection threshold for cold, for warmth and pain. And what we observed in black, these are the women who requested no analgesia. So experienced no lower pain, and the other uh, clear symbols are our control group. And what you can see is that the people who had no labor pain also had a lower cold pain threshold. You had to make it colder for them to go ouch. That a higher heat pain threshold, a higher heat required to make them go ouch. And the pressure pain is done with basically a blood pressure cuff on the upper arm. And again, it's a much higher threshold. So this was interesting. It looked like the labor pain or the, the absence of labor pain was part of a systemic change in pain response. Now, there are three red triangles here, and that's because these three people were identified as having a rare allele of this particular gene, KCNG4, which encodes a voltage-gated potassium channel. Now, we only saw three heterozygotes in a cohort where we should have had 0.7. <clears throat> now, potassium channels are vital for your electrical functioning of your nerves. When you have an action potential, they're the part that bring about repolarization. <clears throat> but 6.4 itself is a bit boring. It's what's called a silent subunit. If you took it and measured activity of cells expressing just that protein, nothing would happen. What it does, though, is it modulates other potassium channels. And I'll show you that in a minute. This is just showing you that this is our KCNG4. 
The mutation is in a part of the ion channel called the selectivity filter that is important for getting just potassium through that ion channel and not other ions. And it's conserved throughout lots of different um, isoforms of the channel in humans, as well as in a variety of different species. So this is a very strange point to have a mutation. <clears throat> so what does it do? Well, what we can do is we can measure the activity of potassium channels in a hex cell, so a human cell line. And what we're measuring here is the inactivation of this ion channel. So what we can say is the resting membrane potential of cells is roughly 50, minus 50, 60 millivolts. And at these membrane potentials, we get 100% of the current when we have KV2.1 on its own. So the ion channels are open and they're releasing potassium. When we take the natural scenario of having the wild type version of 6.4, we get a big shift to the left. And broadly what this means is that around the resting membrane potential, these channels are now shut. If we put in our variants we've identified in these women, it shifts in the opposite direction. It goes back as though it's got no regulation at all, which again means our potassium channel would be open. Now, if potassium channels are leaking potassium, that's going to make you be a very unexcitable cell, which would correlate with less pain, potentially. The women we investigated were heterozygous, and we see here a dominant negative effect. The valine is the normal, we get this change that I showed you. When we add in our, uh, our variant, it goes back to as though there was no regulation at all. If you have both the common and the minor variant, we had a dominant negative effect. So these ion channels important to controlling excitability are now disabled with this variant. What's going on is we can look at where these ion channels are present. We've got a marker here for the cell uh, membrane. We can now look at the expression in green of where these potassium channels are. This is the wild type channel. It's at the plasma membrane where every good ion channel should be. The mutant, by contrast, stays in the cell cytoplasm. And we can do this if we put lines through the cells. We can measure in red is the cell membrane and we get peaks of green for the wild type channel because that's where it needs to get to. But in the situation with a variant or we get co-expression, the ion channel just stays inside the cell. It's not getting to where it has a function. So essentially you've got a situation where only 2.1 is at the membrane and functioning. So what does this mean in terms of labor pain? Well, with the mouse, everything's a bit different, but they have two uterine horns. We labeled these the fast blue just to check is actually the ion channel or interest or is it actually present in sensory nerves innovating the point at which we've first uh, experienced or observed this pain phenotype. And we're looking here at the 2.1 uh, the, the in purple and the 6.4 in green, they're present together. And important, we've used two markers of nociceptors, so pain sensing genes in blue and red here. And yes, they're present in the uterus, and yes, they're present in um, putative nociceptors. So this is all encouraging. What we then wanted to do was do a bit of a complicated experiment to look at could we change activity in mouse sensory neurons. This is complicated because there's lots of potassium channels. We have to use a particular toxin to isolate the one of interest. So we're now looking at our DRG sensory neurons. And we're overexpressing either the wild type potassium channel or the mutant. Now the wild type channel shown here in clear symbols shifts this inactivation again to the left. This means you're switching potassium off. That means you're going to be making those cells quite excitable. By contrast, in the variant, we don't have this shift. That means you've got more potassium leaking out, and these cells are likely to be hypo-excitable. We can indeed show that by measuring the ability to evoke action potentials in our wild-type situation versus our variant situation. And again, what you can see here is we have to evoke much more current in our variant. So if we look at this ramp, we're injecting current, injecting current, our wild type starts firing here, our variant fires at higher input. So what you have here is a situation where cells expressing this variant that we've observed in humans with no pain, or less pain rather, is that they're hypo-excitable. And the model we're working on is this. That in the uterus, that's where we first observe the pain. Obviously pain in labor is coming from different parts of the body, the cervix, the uterus, but this, so the uterus is what we focus on the mouse. You have two sorts of potassium channel sets. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but roughly what's happening. We have 2.1 homomers, and we have these 2.1, 6.4 heteromers. And because of the effect on inactivation that this 6.4 has, we're getting a very small potassium efflux at the resting membrane potential. This means the nerves are being controlled and they're open to being excited and generating pain. And remember, pain is always a good thing under control circumstances. By contrast, in the women we identified who required no analgesia, their 6.4 is kept within the cell. It doesn't get to the membrane. We only have this 2.1, 
which has a very different inactivation threshold, such that at the normal resting membrane potential, it's just leaking potassium. So it's harder to excite the cell, and so you get less pain. So to summarize then, we've got this variance which occurs in women who are quesnoanalgesics. It's important for modulating this 2.1, which is widely expressed in sensory neurons. It itself is non-functional. You get a greater potassium channel for current, you get hyperexcitable neurons and less pain. And so the question now is, well, that's all well and good. Does this channel represent a therapeutic target for analgesia? So the idea is by having studied these women, we've identified a new iron channel variant that can control pain. And so that is now the next question. Because remember, the women themselves had altered pain thresholds for both heat, cold, and pressure pain. So not saying this is specific to labor pain, it's just how we identified this variant. All right, um, I'm going to stop there because that's probably about the right sort of time to stop, I guess. Uh, this is the group a few months ago. Those in bold are the ones who really contributed a lot to the work. Uh, Luke and Becky worked with Sam and Gerard worked a lot with Jim. Um, but I've uh, got lots of people I should be saying thank you to here for funding. But I think it's also important to bear in mind that we can't stand here at the moment because we're on lockdown. So this is currently the group working via Zoom as, as we are doing now. OK, so I will stop there and endeavour to pass control back to... Tom, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Right, well, uh, Ewan, that's um, really fascinating stuff. And, and you know, we, we have a range of talks here at Grand Rounds from very clinical things to um, you know, audit and, uh, and, and sometimes uh, you know, procedural things. And then this is proper, proper science. You know, what we would say at home back in Yorkshire, proper science. So I'm really grateful for you walking us through that. Um, mixed audience from a professor of chronic pain in the audience to, to just a pleb like me. So, uh, so really well, well handled, excellent. The, the message I take from that is that, are you, gonna are you gonna test for this potassium channel in men to prove once and for all that women have a higher pain threshold than men? Well, I guess I always have to be careful here, not, not when we talk about labor pain, not having experienced it myself. I think that the thing we really have to do is try and understand, will this channel represent a good target for pain relief? Because the big problem with when you start messing around with iron channels controlling nervous excitability is we've got the brain to consider. You don't want to end up giving something that can have get impact into the brain. Obviously, a lot of drugs that control, control epilepsy, uh, some of those work upon potassium channels. Um, so we need to be very careful when we hit that system. Um, but I certainly think it would be uh, an option to look in, in the biobank to see, um, we've done this for women because of going through revisions of the experiments, we haven't looked at men to see if, if the same variation occurs. But yeah, it's something we should probably have a look at. Um, now, Leslie Colvin, who is our Professor of Chronic Pain, has left the meeting, or she has another meeting, but she left a question for me to read out. So, um, have you or anyone else looked at the effects of um, osteoarthritis cerebral fluid on activity dependent slowing? Also, is there any difference in sensory neuron response between males and females? Oh, there you go. I've just said that. That's, that's um, so uh, the slowing, no, we haven't looked. Uh, the males and females. So the data I presented is from quite a small group of patients. But we did have male and female samples. And what was really cool was we blinded this student who was doing the experiments to where, what the samples were, whether it was control fluid, whether it was from osteoarthritis patients, whether it's male, female, and so on and so forth. And the cool thing was, and it's now been repeated by a new student, is that every osteoarthritic synovial fluid sample has a very similar effect. Some are more potent, but there are, there are a consistent effect. And we see no difference if it's based on male and female. What we're currently trying to do, but, but COVID has understandably interfered with my ethics uh, um, uh, submission, is we're trying to get a larger cohort of patients where we're specifying we want these to be people of a certain uh, radiological score for their osteoarthritis. We want to look at males versus females so we can really look at this with much greater power. What we've done so far is an initial sort of proof of concept that at least to us says this is a nice way of looking at the activity of synovial fluid because not only can we identify new disease mediators but another cool tool could be that if you're running a clinical trial looking at pain relief in osteoarthritis we would be able to take synovial fluid samples from those patients pre and post treatment and use our system as a readout of are your drugs that you're giving in the clinic having an effect on how that synovial fluid is functioning? So it's very much at the early stages. All I can say is initially we've seen no change in male versus female, but I think we need to look at higher numbers of people, um, look in greater detail at their uh, clinical phenotypes. All we've done so far is look at pain score, OA, okay, let's see what happens. Right, well that 
like I say, I've been a fascinating talk and a really great way to reboot and restart our Grand Round program here in, in Dundee. Um, so I can only thank you for stepping in at really, really short notice, um, you know, less than a week's notice. So thank you very much for doing that. And um, I've had a couple of messages saying that they're slightly freaked out by the more rats behind you. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but they're uh, really beautiful. I mean, the polite way of saying is they look like a cocktail sausage with teeth, but there are obviously other words one could use. But they're much more friendly when you have one in the hand than when you're looking at a picture. Right. So we all need a hobby. So... Um, for, for the audience, thank you very much for, for sticking with us. Um, next week, we're going back to COVID. So if you have been in the COVID front-facing, front, uh, front you know, um, frontline service, you'll know that we have a weekly M&M and education program. Um, so, but if you've not been working uh, in the COVID unit, then you, you won't have heard of it. So we're going to take, get Dave Connell and Monica Doyle are going to pick the, the best of the last two months' work of uh, audit and improvement work uh, and some bits of research and, and some case histories from HGU and ICU so you can find out what we've been doing in the in the behind the doors of the COVID unit. Following that I've got an empty roster for a few weeks so if you do want to give a talk at Grand Rounds please let me know and this will be the format going forwards. Um, going further, further forwards we've got some talks from primary care thank you and we have um, the chief of cardiac surgery from Harvard who's going to be speaking about cardiac surgery in the COVID world sometime in July. This has all been recorded um, so I'm going to edit it a little bit just uh, clip off the edges and then put it on the YouTube channel which you, the, uh, the address is in the email so if you want to watch it again or you want to watch Grand Rounds all the way back to 2013, you can do that on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe. Thank you once again to Ewan. Fantastic talk. See you all next week, hopefully. Thanks for sticking with us. Cheers. <laughs>